Hi, I'm Rachel, and this is my AM reading video for Friday, December 17th, 2021, on a Saturday. Trademark. <laughs> I feel like my reading life this week is less impressive than last week, although to be fair, I think last week I was covering a little more than a week. But anyway, <laughs> to begin, I read the next short story in this collection by Dorothy Parker, which is my tradition uh, since May. <laughs> and at the rate I'm going will be my tradition for a fair bit longer if I'm going to do one a week for these Friday Reads videos. So anyway, this is another dashed off story called You Were Perfectly Fine, which was written in 1929. And like a lot of her dashed off stories, it's a quick interaction between a man and a woman. In this case, the man uh, is obviously uh, hungover, uh, getting up in the middle of the afternoon and saying, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear. And he's talking to the woman about what happened last night, which he obviously doesn't remember at all. And so it's rather comic when it's like, oh, well, you were singing and we couldn't get you to shut up. And the waiter was okay with it. But like, she's obviously trying to soothe him. Like, you know, <laughs> he was obviously more annoying than, um, you know, she's letting on because she's trying to uh, keep him in a good frame of mind and you know he was like she's saying that like he started almost started a fight or actually started a fight with some older guy at the establishment they were at because he didn't like his necktie so it's one of those comedy of manners things again which ends with the woman saying well i hope you remember the taxi ride we took and it was such a big deal to me and so personal and you opened up and that sort of stuff and he's like yeah sure sure but you know you have to question his honesty there and perhaps her intentions, but I feel like going um, off of Dorothy Parker's other short stories, it's probably less malicious, especially since it turned out basically just to be a conversation. It's kind of less malicious than perhaps clueless. A lot of uh, her female characters can be kind of clueless to social situations, which can get a little old sometimes. But it was certainly funny here, and you know, it's a nice reminder about... Uh, how things don't always change so much because I feel like this sort of interaction more or less could take place on a college campus or any other, you know, environment that encourages, you know, rowdy uh, behavior that gets you unsober, <laughs> you know, party behavior, that sort of thing. So anyway, uh, it was enjoyable. The book I finished this week is this one. This is Israel, A Simple Guide to the Most Misunderstood Country on Earth by Noah Tishby, which I am showing off here on my brand new iPad. <laughs> Speaking of rowdy behavior, uh, you know, there's a club nearby me, so sometimes I hear some rowdiness at night myself, but uh, I also have a uh, waning battery, so I guess I should go on here, <laughs> come what may. Anyway, I'm showing off my brand new iPad, although I feel like iPads don't really look much different. I mean, this is my first iPad in 10 years. And so like, you know, some of the uh, software interface looks different, but <laughs> the actual device, I guess not so much. And it's funny I'm showing it on here because I actually didn't get the iPad in time to read the book, but uh, I figured I'd show it off anyway. I read the book as an ebook for my uh, synagogue's uh, Israel book club, basically, where we are reading books uh, one per month, uh, nonfiction and fiction from Israeli and Palestinian viewpoints. And this is very much uh, an Israeli viewpoint. Uh, Noah Tishby is an actress and an entertainment uh, person who uh, now lives in America, but uh, you know, grew up in Israel. I know her for uh, bringing or helping to bring Beatty Pool or in treatment to uh, American audiences, which is pretty cool. But anyway, uh, it is a book uh, that has its uh, controversies, its flaws. It's quite obviously meant uh, to be not a history as much as um, I'd say a certain point of view book. I mean, I did come into it and I was concerned. Uh, I read the Jewish Book Council's review, and I do think that its criticisms of the book were largely valid. I mean, it's a one-sided book, uh, but it wasn't quite as forgiving of uh, Israel's flaws as I feared it would be. I mean, there is some acknowledgement of uh, 
well, frankly, structural racism and that sort of thing, mostly from within Israel and mostly in a glancing manner. I mean, uh, it is certainly a book that's supposed to take a, a sort of a sweeping uh, overview, so that might be her excuse for not getting too into the weeds, uh, but uh, that does make it, uh, you know, have that bias, that one-sidedness. Uh, but I, I did like it more than I thought. I ended up discussing it with a subgroup uh, over Zoom in the book club of, I think, people largely like me, progressive uh, Jews who, you know, felt an affinity to this book, uh, especially for its historical context. I guess it's ironical to say after I said it's not a history book, but it does have a really nice uh, sweeping overview of uh, Israel uh, starting as the... Um, the uh, ancient land of Israel from, uh, you know, Solomon sort of days, King Solomon sort of days, and the earliest of uh, Israel, Israelite, uh, you know, now Jewish uh, history, uh, that uh, archaeologically there, uh, and, and taking a sweeping view from there into uh, the modern age. I, I, I appreciated that, and I appreciated uh, Tishbe's uh, look into her own family and... Uh, the realities of what it was like for her to grow up in a uh, country that uh, is so often embroiled in war, and of course she's had losses there. And I feel like this is a worthy perspective to get on uh, on the conflict. And I also agree very much with a sort of broader mission that she seemed to have about uh, how on the world stage you can't treat Israel like, you know, a mustache twirling vi villain when uh, it's a refuge and a home and a cultural and historical center for so much of world Jewry. Uh, so that stuff, I think, came off really well and that she used, obviously, a very uh, funny and approachable uh, writing style so that it could be um, a fun book to read, like kind of a quick and quick quippy. But that being said, this issue is so polarized, I don't know if uh, everyone would enjoy reading the book. I, I would hope that people would read it with uh, the intention, intention of getting that perspective out of it. But of course, it has its downsides, particularly when she does try to go into describing, uh, you know, the Palestinian side of things, and she really doesn't. Uh, and she, you know, no longer has facts and figures and, you know, personal perspectives uh, because that's not her experience and not really her goal with the book, which is to talk more about, uh, you know, Israel's uh, history and uh, what it's dealing with and some acknowledgement uh, very briefly of its flaws, but it is lacking um, a comprehensive perspective of the conflict. So, yeah, it, uh, we talked about struggling with the book in that way, that there was a lot um, that uh, I and the people I was talking with, you know, really could relate to, but, you know, it had its uh, flaws. Uh, and that we really d didn't necessarily see ourselves recommending the book to anyone outside of our own circle. It's one of those sad issues uh, where everything's so polarized now that uh, you can't imagine someone who doesn't agree with you, you know, <laughs> getting something out of the book, but I figure I'll take that mo this moment here to say that I do think uh, other readers could get something out of this book, uh, you know, with regard to the perspective that Tishby brings, uh, but it has, its, uh, it has its limitations as well. Moving on to something less controversial, I would think, uh, I am reading uh, By Nightfall by Michael Cunningham, which I think was the first book he published after the Hours, which is what he's most well known for, for winning the Pulitzer, turning into a movie, blah, blah, blah. Uh, but this one, actually, uh, I've been excited about a little piece of media attached to this book for a while. Um, Ron Charles, who is the editor of the Washington Post uh, book section, he occasionally does these satirical uh, rev uh, video reviews of books. It's like he's almost a booktuber himself. <laughs> uh, and years ago, when this book came out, uh, he did one for this book, <laughs> which I'd already watched, but now I have a little more context for it. And the video is just really funny. Uh, 
He ends up using this uh, Taylor Lautner doll, uh, where he's made up uh, as Jacob Black from the Twilight series with the hunkiness and the tattoo and everything, which is just really funny to see when you understand that context. But it also kind of fits in with what he's um, satirizing about this book, which is a very slight, very literary, relatively plot-free or plot-light uh, book. Um, about this uh, middle-aged 40-ish man named Peter. He works as an art dealer and lives with his wife, who's an editor in New York. So they're very much from that bourgeois, artsy New York, I suppose. And his wife's much younger brother, uh, who is called Mizzy, for mistake, <laughs> because I think of when he was born and the life cycle of his parents, comes to stay with them. Uh, and Mizzy is someone who, uh, you know, he's, uh, you know, half Peter's age and uh, is uncertain about his life uh, and sort of had just came back from sort of uh, going to Japan in an attempt to find himself. And he also had been struggling with drug use, uh, but he's also still very virile and young and hot and bisexual. And <laughs> so uh, he presents a couple of challenges for Peter and his own ennui and his own sort of midlife crisis about like, who am I in my marriage as I get older and my wife gets older and, uh, you know, he's also having issues with his own daughter who's only slightly younger than Mizzy. Uh, and he kind of gets an obsession uh, attraction with Mizzy, uh, I think having to do with very much there's a uh, point of view, sort of a uh, artistic uh, point of view about uh, falling for the beauty of people and of art and that sort of thing. And Mizzy is this hot Taylor Lautner-esque sort of work of art, I guess, that Peter kind of falls for. And also, Mizzy almost looks a little bit like his wife when uh, she was younger. Uh, I don't know, there's a, I wouldn't say fully androgynous, but certainly, um, appreciative of uh, queer identity sort of uh, feel to this book. I mean, not just, you know, blatant queer identity of, you know, you know, Mizzy is bisexual and also uh, Peter had a gay brother who died of AIDS and Peter himself is straight. And I don't necessarily feel like uh, Cunningham is saying that he's anything else other than the fact that I personally believe maybe uh, more people are on a spectrum of uh, sexual sexuality than uh, they think they are. But uh, maybe I'll just leave that uh, perhaps controversial point right there. <laughs> but anyway, that's uh, where this uh, book comes in, discussing, uh, you know, in this interior drama way sort of realities. And it's really just a midlife crisis. It's somewhat sexual. It's somewhat about identity and who I am and what my relationships are like. I feel like this book wouldn't appeal to a whole lot of people because it is so interior and Peter is a self-involved, highly self-involved character. I mean, I feel, feel like I feel it the most when he's talking about his relationship with his daughter. And I guess maybe because, you know, parent-child relationships, uh, you know, within our culture feel like, or at least my understanding of it feel like, they should privilege the child you know, and in Peter's head, you know, he has his own expectations that his daughter didn't meet and he's, you know, conflicted about it and that sort of thing. Uh, and a lot of this really does come down to the writing and how Cunningham is a literary writer. And I think it took me a little while even to get into this book, the stream of consciousness almost feel to it. Uh, no wonder he likes uh, Mrs. Dalloway and uh, Virginia Woolf and all his stuff that he uh, wrote about in the hours so much. <laughs> but yeah, uh, you know, if literary fiction is your sort of thing, this could possibly be your sort of book if you are a little more on the uh, language side. I mean, it's certainly for me not far enough into the language and plotless and characterless side that I dislike it. Uh, but it's definitely more in that direction than most commercial fiction. <laughs> So that's what I've been reading for now. I'm not quite through with By Nightfall yet, but I do have more books on the docket that I would like to finish in December, including this bind up of the Foundation Trilogy, like 700 pages in here, which I said I'd start last week and I still haven't started because I have difficulties with, you know, reading two things at once. And uh, this is supposed to be my read at home book and I haven't been reading it at home, but. Here it is, and here is me still wanting to read this uh, trilogy before the end of the year. <laughs>
And then there's the third and final book that I own by Michael Cunningham. I mean, he's written more, but I don't, you know, have them on me. But this, I think, is one of his uh, earliest, Flesh and Blood. Uh, it's uh, another family drama, but much larger, too, you know? I feel like I've read, uh, you know, technically I have eight books on my list for December, and I've read four of them, but they're the shorter ones. <laughs> Here's another chunky one. And finally, this is my page 112 tag pick uh, from my last video. The book I chose is Beshert by Herb Fried. Beshert meaning uh, beloved in Yiddish, and it's more traditionally sized for literary slash mainstream fiction. Uh, but it's still another thing on the list that I want to get to uh, before the end of the month and the end of the year. So that's what's in the back of my head about my reading. <laughs> I will be doing uh, one more AM reading video, I plan to, hope to, uh, in uh, December, uh, so stay tuned for that, but actually my next video uh, in a few days should be my monthly author's answer video, so stay tuned for that. But other than that, that covers it for me now. I feel like I should stop talking and start reading. <laughs> It's also the weekend, and I have things coming up as we uh, approach uh, the rest of holiday season, as it were. Uh, I have some writing goals at the salon I go to uh, over the weekend. Uh, and then on Sunday, uh, there is this uh, outdoor holiday bazaar uh, in uh, DC that I'm hoping to get to. Uh, not so much uh, to buy uh, Christmas gifts uh, for people, but my mom and my sister both have uh, early in the year birthdays in January and February, and so I figured this could be a nice time to go searching for, you know, jewelry made by local artists uh, for them. This uh, bazaar I'm going to actually uh, seems like it's uh, pretty well populated, so I'll, I'll leave a link down below if uh, you're in the DC area or otherwise interested in local DC artists. And yeah, I've already rambled that I'll be back hopefully in the next few days to do an author's answer video. So with that, I think I've said all I need to say. I hope the rest of you are uh, enjoying uh, the last few weeks of uh, December as we, you know, inch into them here. Uh, thanks so much for watching, everyone. And I'll see you next time.